This is a blog about practical methods take practice. The, the Sanskrit word Buddha just means awakened or aware or the, the, the aware one, the, uh, you know, the one who is aware. And so um, even the word Buddha points out awareness and uh, what's called the Dharma is just the path to becoming aware and that's, that's all there is to it. Now, there are all kinds of medicines and therapies out there, and some really help, and, uh, but most of them are what the Buddhists call relative truths. And that simply means that they can help us on our journey in getting from here to there, there being some place we want to get to. Most therapies address the symptoms and how to remove them rather than the cause itself. Buddhist teachings address the cause, and they also, uh, that's what the Dharma is, offer a method for removing the cause. And the cause is always our ignorance, you know, what we ignore, basically our lack of awareness. So removing the cause, cause in a Buddhist sense means waking up to our innate awareness, just becoming aware of our awareness. And Buddhism's not a religion like most Americans are raised in. I mean, for example, it, in Christianity, there's a separation between mankind and God. And that gap is addressed by Jesus Christ, who's called God's son. But there's also a gap between Christ and mankind, you know, as well. And as a young man, I was raised Catholic. I researched this very carefully with the Jesuits. And they're really uh, Catholicism scholars. And they very clearly stated to me that Christ is not us. He also is God, but we are just human. And it has uh, become a habit to believe in this way. Uh, my advice is don't bring that whole concept of having to believe in something to the Dharma because it doesn't help. We don't believe in the Dharma we test and use it. And Buddha was not a god, and there's absolutely no gap between you and the Buddha as to our essential nature. They're identical. So holy to Christians is not necessarily holy to Buddhists. There's no separation other than by practice between you and the Buddha himself. So that's an important point. Let's not separate the Buddha from ourselves by putting him on a pedestal. That's the idea. Respect his methods because they work. Um, that's all that makes the Dharma or the Buddha sacred to us. We need to keep the Dharma close to us. Too close. It's, it's our Dharma. It's our key to awareness, our path. It's a method designed specifically to work for us to become more aware. Now, there are said to be 84,000 dharmas, or individual ways or paths to become enlightened. And perhaps there are just as many dharma teachers. And there are short paths and longer paths, paths that can be traversed in this lifetime, but also paths that take many lifetimes. Now, the old phrase, slow and steady, uh, wins the race. Um, so most of us, most folks are introduced to a path like learning to meditate that will take a long time. If for whatever reasons, and they might be our own, that we need to take a faster path, this usually requires more or at least slightly different practices on our part. In Tibet, for example, in general, simple meditation like we're trying to learn in this country it's not even taught in the beginning, as it is here. Before basic meditation is attempted, most Tibetans undertake what amounts to um, what I call a Dharma boot camp called Nundro. Very difficult. In other words, basic meditation is a way more advanced practice 
rather than one uh, for beginners. Now, the Nundro practice that I mentioned, this Dharma boot camp, which I'm only going to mention here briefly, it's designed to clear away some of the more gross obscurations that we've got so that meditation can be more successful. And perhaps chief among these obscurations or obstacles are the large emotional upheavals that we have, which they call kleshas. These would be emotions like anger or jealousy, hatred, you know, desire, ignorance, and so on. Now, these emotional problems, these kleshas, are nothing to be ashamed of, but they do require our awareness and attention unless we want to allow them to continue to just kind of rule us. It's considered very difficult to make progress in living a happy life if these kleshas like uh, anger and so forth constantly interrupt the life and set us back, you know, an hour, uh, part of a day or a day at a time and so on. It's kind of like, the you know, two steps forward and one step back or sometimes one step forward and two steps back. Once a klesha like anger gets out of our control, it can take over our, our whole mind and we wake up later down the road of life having kind of wrecked our mental state once again. It's unlike simple bad thoughts that can be dealt with uh, through dharma practices like Tonglen. A full-blown klesha like anger, for most of us anyway, is beyond our ability to root it out without special additional practices. These kleshas like anger and jealousy tend to come over us somewhat, you know, suddenly, and they can get out of control before we're fully aware that they're even present. We end up, you know, being carried away with them, and we're helpless until they eventually, um, after savaging our mind stream and wrecking our mind, they blow themselves out. The remedy for this is to become more aware of our emotions while they're still at arm's length, you know, before they get a hold of us. Unfortunately, this kind of awareness training has to be learned and it has to be also practiced. We don't just start out practicing on kleshas like anger and jealousy. They're too ingrained. They're too powerful. We have to start with smaller reactions and gradually work up to these big obscurations like anger. 